I do get angry when I when I think of, you know, the unsustainable lifestyle of so many of that, this materialistic, Western-based, um, you know, culture. Jane Goodall is famous for her trailblazing work with chimpanzees, but she is also a passionate conservationist. The subject of her latest book is her love of nature. Without plants, none of us would be here, chimpanzees, people, or anything else. Goodall has been called the woman who redefined man for changing the way we think about chimpanzees and the evolutionary tree. I think the most shocking but very fascinating thing is when I realized that, like us, they have a dark side. They are capable of violence, brutality, and a kind of primitive war. I also spoke to the steadfast scientist about changing technology. GIS, GPS, uh, satellite imagery mapping. Experiments on animals, animal enclosures. Zoos and zoos and zoos. And a bit about her early days. I fell in love with Tarzan, and silly man married the wrong Jane, didn't he? But a new book about plants. <laughs> can, you, can you draw the line for us between plants and chimpanzees? Well, in fact, without plants, none of us would be here, chimpanzees, people, or anything else, because everything either lives on plant food or lives on creatures that live on plant food. And it was like, the, honestly, the plants put little roots into my brain and said, Jane, you spend all your life helping animals. It's our turn now. And so the book took its own life. You talk in this book about the love affair between humans and plants. Where did your love affair with plants begin? Oh, it began when I was a little girl growing up in my garden uh, in England. And I climbed all the trees there. And one beech tree was so special to me that I made my grandmother sign it over to me in her will. I wrote out a little will for her. And tried, it, it wasn't a good garden for growing things. The soil was too acidic, but we tried. And then we were surrounded by wild cliffs over the sea in Bournemouth. And that's where I used to roam with my dog, Rusty. You talk about communication between humans and plants, humans and trees. You, you believe in talking to trees, and you raise the question about whether trees can talk to us. What, what is this about communication with plants? Well, uh, you know, a lot of people find that their plants grow better if they sp speak to them. I have one lovely old friend who sings to his tomatoes, and <laughs> he says they grow much better that way. And certainly plants are healing, so that torture victims, for example, they may take the first steps towards normal life out in the garden with their therapist. Children need plants, need nature, for their proper psychological development. So they are, it's really important that we, that we understand and love the green things around us. I mean, one of the things you also discuss in this book is uh, the, the challenges facing forests around the world. What do you think are the biggest challenges? Facing the forests, human greed, and human need. I mean, on the one hand, you've got desperately poor people, and they've got to try and feed their family. They don't have money to <clears throat> buy food, so they're cutting down trees to grow you know, crops or to make charcoal so they can get a bit of money and buy a bit of food. And then on the other hand, you've got the big timber companies uh, coming in, some of them still clear-cutting, and sort of paying lots of money for a forest concession to the, to the government. And then the people living in the forest suffer as well as everything else. In, in fact, in, in your book, I just want to read a couple of lines that uh, you write in Chapter 18, Hope for, for Nature. And you say, the truth is that when corporate greed and public demand for a better and better lifestyle are pitted against the health of the environment and the health of people, for that matter, it is the bottom line that wins. Have we totally lost the wisdom of the indigenous people who made decisions based on how they would affect their people in years to come? How many more supermarkets? How many more luxury apartments do we need? I mean, you sound like a, uh, an environmental activist, uh, an angry environmental activist here. Well, I, d I do get angry when I, when I think of, you know, the unsustainable lifestyle of so many of the, this materialistic, Western-based, um, you know, culture. And how many of us have 
so much more than we need. I mean, you know, we need money to live, and what, what goes wrong is when we, when we live for money, and that's happening more and more often. And, and as a result, I think, it's a very empty kind of society, and people, when you live and money is your goal and your god, then I think people lose a lot of sensitivity and human values and love and compassion. You, you say that it's not only avarice, but it's ignorance. What is, what is the ignorance? What, what don't we know? Well, some people seem to know very little, and some people don't even want to know very much. I mean, just, let, OK, let's take one example. Um, meat. More and more people getting more and more wealthy, increased middle classes. So we must all eat meat, more and more meat. So we, we raise billions of animals for food. And this is destroying millions of square miles of forest every year to f grow the grain or to graze the cattle. And this is releasing CO2 into the atmosphere from the trees and the forest floor. And so this is adding to climate change. You're a vegetarian. Of course. Why, uh, when did that happen? Oh, in the very late 60s. And my, my reason for being a vegetarian was, you know, the suffering of the animals. But even if people couldn't care less about the animals, uh, you know, there's all this environmental impact and the, the um, antibiotics needed to keep the poor creatures alive, get out in the environment. You have great hope for nature, and, and, and hope is a theme through much of your writing. Um, I was touched by the stories at the end of the book that talk about a couple of trees, a survivor in particular. Can you tell that story? Yes, Survivor is very dear to me because I was in New York at 9-11 and they found the, the one piece of tree that was still alive out of all the trees that were around those twin towers and it looked like a dead stump blackened with fire and everything but some people took it and nurtured it and this tree now is back uh, at ground zero and it's a beautiful pear and I've seen it in blossom. But that tree somehow epitomizes the resilience of nature and the passion of people, because so many people said, oh, throw it away, you'll never get this tree to grow. But they didn't give up. It was also damaged by a storm, wasn't it? Was, it was, yes, it had just begun to, to recover, and I think it was Hurricane Sandy that tore it down, and they rushed out and desperately propped it up. And it, it's had a very dramatic life. And it survives today. What, what does that tell us about uh, your hope for the future? Well, my hope for the future is, is actually based on the fact that I think we have a window of time. We can start changing things around if we just think about the consequences of the little choices we make each day. You know, what do we buy? Where did it come from? How was it made? Did it harm the environment? And it, it's young people that get this. You speak of another tree, a cherry tree at Fukushima, another example of a tree surviving. But, you know, in that example, um, I really wonder about our world and where we're headed and, and, and whether or not there is hope when you see a disaster like that. Fukushima. Fukushima. Yeah. Well, it's, as I say, it's a, it's a hope based on the fact that we can do it, but in order to change the world and make it start moving in a better direction, instead of heading downhill to start leveling it off and then eventually coming up, we have to change attitudes. That's the thing. And you know, when people lose hope, as many people do, because many biologists point out that there isn't any hope, but if everybody loses hope, what happens? You fall into apathy. There's no point doing anything. It doesn't matter. But uh, how can we be bringing our children into a world and telling them there's no hope? That's cruel. You know, I suppose I'm lucky in that I have the opportunity to see some amazingly beautiful places, like the forests where all life is entwined. And once, you, once you've seen it, you just feel desperate to try and save it. I want my great-grandchildren to have these experiences. You say in some ways um, the, there's a saying about inheriting the earth from our parents, but you say in some ways we've stolen. We have. 
Uh, we have stolen their future. And, you know, I began the youth program because I met so many young people who, who had lost hope, who said, well, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. We have, but there is something we can do about it. At least I shall die fighting for that. I, we have so much more to talk about. I want to ask you about the chim chimpanzees and about what you're doing today when we come back right after this. Only on Al Jazeera America. I live that character. Go one on one with America's movers and shakers. We will be able to see change. Gripping, inspiring, entertaining. <laughs> No topic off limits. And I'm like, Dad, there are hookers in this house. <laughs> Exclusive conversations you won't find anywhere else. These are very vivid human stories. If you have an agenda with people, you sometimes don't see the truth. To watch new episodes of Talk to Al Jazeera, check your local listings or visit aljazeera.com. We're back with Jane Goodall. What's the most interesting thing you've learned about chimpanzees over the years? how like us they are, or how like them we are. And I think the most shocking but very fascinating thing is when I realized that like us, they have a dark side. And that made them sadly seem more like us than I had thought before. But they are capable of violence, brutality, and a kind of primitive war. Can you take me back to the beginning? Um... You were secretary for anthropologist Louis Leakey. That's where you got your start, right? That's where I got my start. How did that happen? Well, when I was a tiny little girl, I wanted to go and study animals in Africa because I fell in love with Tarzan. And silly man married the wrong Jane, didn't he? But anyway, I was very jealous of her. But <clears throat> I decided I wanted to go to Africa and live with animals and write books about them. And everybody laughed except my amazing mother, who just said, well, if you really want something, you'll have to work hard and take advantage of opportunity, and you'll get there in the end. So I got invited by a school friend, saved up my money working as a waitress, got out to Africa, heard about Louis Leakey, went to see him at the museum. I wasn't asking for a job, but um, he took me around. He asked me hundreds of questions. And because I'd gone on learning about Africa and animals and spent hours in the Natural History Museum in London, I could answer many of his questions, and he just offered me a job as his secretary. And he believed you had the temperament to survive uh, isolation. You had no formal scientific education? Zero. Um, <laughs> and when was your first attempt to observe the chimpanzees? It was 1960, he finally got the money for me to go. And the biggest problem to start with was that they all ran away. You know, they're very conservative, never seen a white ape before. And uh, so they ran away. But eventually, one of them, whom I named David Greybeard, with his nice white beard, um, began to lose his fear. And that really opened a door for me. How did you, how did you gain their trust? Patience, wearing the same colored clothes, all the time, pretending I wasn't interested in them. You, you said they have a dark side. Were you concerned about your safety? Well, I didn't know they had a dark side back then. Although I must say, after they lost their fear, they became a bit belligerent and treated me as though I was a you know, predator and screamed at me. When, when a male chimp stands upright with his hair bristling, he's about so big, you know, they are extremely intimidating creatures. It seems like a real challenge to have uh, put yourself in their world. Um, did you see it as a challenge? I saw it as just my dreams come true. And there was a strong, you know, because everybody laughed at Louis Leakin, told him he was stupid and, and everything. So I really, really wanted to prove that, that he wasn't stupid and that I could do it. But I wanted to do it. What do you think he saw in you? I, I don't know. I wish he was alive and we could ask him. But <laughs> I think he saw somebody who was very determined and who wanted to do exactly what he wanted somebody to do. Were there sacrifices you made in your life in order to do this work? Well, it didn't really seem like sacrifices to me. You know, people say, well, what about family life? We had very, very close family bonds, and I still do. 
you know. So I had my son with me till he was 12, all the time. How did your family see the work that you did? What, what did they have to say about it when you first started um, going into the jungle and hanging out with chimps? Well, my mother came. I wasn't allowed to be alone by the British authorities. It was Tanganyika then. And um, they said, no, no, no. And in the end, they said, oh, but she, she must come with a companion. So my amazing mother volunteered for four months. I mean, how many mothers would? You know, we had this old second-hand army tent, no sewn-in ground sheets, so a piece of canvas on the ground, roll up the sides to let in the air, and you let in the spiders and the snakes and the scorpions as well, which I didn't mind, but poor mum, you know. But didn't you have friends who said, look, you know, this is great while you're young, but you need to settle down and do something that's uh, like normal people do? <laughs> no, no, I think everybody <laughs> knew me too well. They really? Didn't, they didn't say that. And you know, in those days, a lot of young people today can't imagine it, but in those days, um, you know, women basically, having a career was something was a bit fun to do and it was new, but Basically, you thought that a man would sweep you off your feet and you'd have a family and he would provide for you. So it was much easier to have patience out in the field, I think. Coming up, Jane Goodall talks about her favorite animal, and it's not a chimp. I'm John Siegenthaler. Welcome back. We're talking to Jane Goodall. You just turned 80 years old. Congratulations. <laughs> People are making a big deal of it, but, you know, well. Well, in some ways, you're, you're a timeless figure in um, the study of nature and, and chimpanzees. I, tell me what your life is like now at 80. Well, it's ridiculous, really, because it's, it's literally going from one continent to another. It's aeroplanes and and um, hotels and interviews and lectures. Uh, you said you're on the road some 300 days a year? Yeah. It, it's absurd, it, isn't it? And, and then... You, and you like it? I hate the travel. You do? I hate it. I, oh, who could like going through airports today? <laughs> I mean, it's really horrible. And then, of course, it's, it's a carbon footprint, all this flying, but I, nobody's given me a magic carpet yet. And we do have... I would say millions of young people planting trees now, so I, I hope it makes up. Well, you started this organization called Roots and Shoots. Tell us about it. It began with 12 high school students, and it was about actually empowering young people to roll up their sleeves and make a difference. So once they understand the problems, and they get to choose. We don't tell them what to do, but between them they must choose a project to help people, project to help animals, a project to help the environment. And woven in it is let's learn to live in peace and harmony between religions and cultures. We have so far to go and between us and the natural world. But when we bring them together from around the world, from, you know, we've had from Israel, from Palestine, from um, Kenya, where they've had all these horrible uh, massacres, and we, we get the young people together and they form these close bonds and it is growing very fast all the time because 160,000 groups is probably, some, well, sometimes it's a whole school. So we're right across mainland China. We're growing fast in Australia. We're in every old Western European country. We're every state in the US, across Canada, going very fast into South America. You've spent your life protecting animals, but recently you've been involved in trying to, to help save elephants. Can you talk a little bit about that effort? The poaching of elephants and rhinos and some other animals too has increased so dramatically and it's become such a money earner. So you get criminal cartels coming in 
and the money from slaughtering elephants and selling the ivory is actually supporting some of these terrorist groups. And of course, it's the demand in Asia. And so we're using our roots and shoots groups um, in China. Well, I wouldn't say we're using them because they want to do it. But, you know, the, the slogan is, if the buying stops, the killing stops. And a lot of the Chinese honestly believe that elephants shed their tusks. And like, like deer, so that they don't understand the horrible um, slaughter and suffering, suffering of individual animals, whether it's elephants, rhino, tigers, um, apes being shot for bushmeat. You know, the, the slaughter is going on, it's going on very fast. But once people understand and, and get a feeling for these animals, then they're more prepared to, to go out and do something about it. You've also fought to uh, protect animals from experimentation for uh, medicine. Where does that stand today? Well, actually, it's very exciting because, you know, I first began talking to NIH in 1986, and just last year, um, the new director, Francis Collins, had, well, actually, three years ago, he had a committee put together to investigate what tests were being done on the over 300 NIH chimpanzees and found none of them. Nothing was beneficial to humans. So he said, fine, they can go into sanctuary, into retirement. So we have to raise the money now to get them all, but a lot of them are already uh, in chimp haven sanctuary. So more and more chimps are coming out of medical research. There's very few left. What do you think of zoos? Zoos and zoos and zoos. Some zoos shouldn't be. The change in zoos over my life has been just incredible. And, well, you know, yes, there's an idea that wild animals and freedom, it's the best thing. But in so many cases, they're under threat. Their habitat's being destroyed. There's hunters out there. And then you look at a group in a really good zoo, which has, you know, the right kind of environment. And then you think, well, let me be a chimp. Where would I rather be? So, you know, in the really well-protected places, obviously you want wild animals. How has technology changed the study of animals and plants over your life? Well, it's, it's completely changed. I started with a notebook and a pencil and a pair of second-hand binoculars, which was all we could afford. And um, now, you know, we have the GIS, GPS, uh, satellite imagery mapping, and uh, we, we have ways of measuring stress levels by, again, collecting fecal samples. We hope to do a lot of conservation with working with Google Earth, Esri, Digital Globe, and getting software that enable us to, you know, get much more accurate pictures of where the trees are. But the most key thing um, is that we, we've actually trained the local people to use uh, these um, Android tablets. tablets. Mm -hmm. And so they, they can, they're restoring the forest now, letting it regenerate. It's because in early 91, I flew over the whole area around Gombe and I was, I was so shocked because I knew there was deforestation. I hadn't realized it was total. And it was pretty clear that we can't even try and save the chimps if the people are just struggling to survive because they're going to come into this last, lush, tiny island of forest. So we began improving their lives. And as a result, they're now our partners in, in protecting the chimp habitat, but also restoring the habitat around their own villages. So all those bare hills are now sprinkled with green, and the chimps have three times more forest than they had 10 years ago. I think some people might be surprised to learn that the chimpanzee is not your favorite animal, is that right? Well, I just love dogs. I mean, I just love dogs. I, you know, when I got to Cambridge and was told I shouldn't have given the chimps names, they should have been numbered, and, um, you know, I couldn't talk about them having personality, mind, or emotion. I knew from the childhood teacher, my dog, Rusty, that that couldn't be true. But animals, of course, they have personality. Of course, they can feel happy and sad and, and afraid, just like us. 
and I've always loved dogs. That's my saddest thing now. I can't have my own dog. But clearly, at 80 years old, you have no intention of slowing down. Well, I suppose my body will slow me down at some point, but, you know, I'm lucky and I got my father's genes. In fact, all my family lived long. So as long as I can, I shall go on doing this. Are there things that you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished? My uh, dreams are big, but you can just work towards them. Well, we are happy that you shared your dreams and your story with us. Well, thank you too, John.